Welcome to the Dry Fasting Club and the beautiful world of dry fasting. I'm Yannick Wolf, and I hope to be able to guide you on your dry fasting journey. Before we continue, it's important to note that the information provided here is done to the best of my experience and research. However, it should never be taken as medical advice. You should always speak to a medical professional about your decision to attempt fasting in the first place. Please treat this information as entertainment only. So today's episode will focus on a quick introduction to dry and water fasting for any beginners, explaining why you need to start small when fasting for the first time, talk about the Wolf Beginners Protocol to dry fasting based on my experiences from dozens of dry fasts and over 10 years of water fasting, give a brief overview of preparation for a dry fast, including diet choices, and focus on a detailed refeed that I call the Wolf Omnivore Refeed Chart. So I'm dedicating this episode to beginners who want a clear-cut explanation of one of the methods that I follow. There is not enough information out there on ways of refe refeeding. This is how I would approach dry fasting if I had to start all over again. Think of this episode when you meet someone that is new to fasting and wants to get started as soon as possible. Let them listen to this and understand the importance of starting incremental steps when it comes to fasting. Also, before we continue, fasting is an ancient art that requires nothing from us other than time and discipline. Remember this when someone tries to sell you their miracle powders with wild claims. I'd also like to let everyone know that if you are interested in fasting, specifically dry fasting, make sure you join the Dry Fasting Club's Discord group. It's where you'll find dry fasters that can answer most of your questions as well as like-minded people that are also on the fasting journey. Use it to post your experiences and provide yourself extra accountability. The link to the Discord, as well as references to the topics discussed, will be in the notes. Okay, let's get started. Introduction to dry fasting and fasting in general. So what is fasting? You should have a basic understanding that fasting means extended deprivation of something. You can do dopamine fasts where you are not allowed to do activities that release dopamine, like watching TV, playing video games, or scrolling through social media. You can do food fasts, like intermittent fasting or water fasting, where you don't eat food for a specific time period. Or you can do dry fasting, where you literally put nothing in your body. There is great evidence that fasting is very beneficial to our health. And I'm sure you've heard of this already, or else you wouldn't have been here. There is also a lot of evidence that fasting helps when you are trying to fix addictive behaviors. It can literally rewire your brain. The logic follows that the more you deprive your body, the stronger the healing effects. So, if this line of thinking is followed... Of course, dry fasting will give the most healing because it's the most depriving of all the fasts. This also happens because our body has this amazing mechanism of adaptation. It's called the hormetic effect. The hormetic effect means stress to your body, and it triggers a bunch of different things that will try and make you stronger so that you can withstand that same stress better in the future. In the case of food and water deprivation, the body tries to restructure itself into a more optimized and efficient self. It will try to use energy better, turn off unnecessary parts, eat old and deformed cells, degrade misfolded proteins, and much more. You'll hear of people shrinking their tumors, fixing old injuries, scars disappearing, and skin becoming tighter. It's why fasting shows a rejuvenation effect. You start to feel younger the more you fast. Losing weight is just a bonus in my opinion. 
although the weight loss is phenomenal. Of course, there are a lot of caveats to this. And I'm sure you've all heard that a lot of the weight that you lose during fasting will bounce right back the moment you break it. The same is said about most fad diets that people try. While this is true for maybe 99% of the different diets, and there's also an argument that water fasting is similar, dry fasting is a beast of its own. It's honestly the secret art of weight loss. Your body goes through a recomposition during a dry fast, and you'll really need to try your butt off to regain all the weight, even if you start pigging out. The key here is the refeed. You'll need to refeed slowly while avoiding salt. After the period is finished, you can go back to eating much more and more often. I'm not advocating for you to pig out after a fast though. Please remember that. That is not a good way to go about this. When you start to regain weight and fat, you will notice a better distribution of fat throughout your body. Men specifically will see less fat going to their beer bellies and love handles. Fasting is beautiful because it rebuilds an appreciation for food and in this case, water as well. If, you're ever, if you've ever had trouble ditching coffee or sweets, if you've ever had trouble quitting sodas or delicious fried foods, I can't think of anything faster and more efficient than performing some serious water or dry fasts. Fasting causes a few cascading effects to happen in your body the longer you do it. As you start fasting, your body slowly uses up its glucose reserves. These are reserves that mainly come from you eating carbohydrates in the form of bread, pasta, grains, fruits, sugars, and sweets. As the glucose reserves go down, your body starts panicking a little bit. Uh-oh, our super fast, quick energy is disappearing. Mayday, mayday. This triggers a mechanism called ketosis, where your body starts to realize it needs to start tapping into its fat stores to produce ketones for energy. It turns out that ketones are a much better energy source for the brain than glucose because of their more efficient pathway. When ketones are used to produce energy using oxygen, more ATP is produced per molecule than with glucose. So that's one of the reasons that most people that are fasting say that their mental state improves during a fast. They feel better, sometimes more energized. They can think faster and clearer. It's because the brain runs better on ketones. Out of the other hundreds of mechanisms that are started during fasting, autophagy is one of the most important, and hopefully you've heard about it. Autophagy is the golden ticket as to why fasting has so many benefits. Autophagy is your body's process of reusing old and damaged cell parts. Cells are the basic building blocks of every tissue and organ in your body. Each cell contains multiple parts that keep it functioning. Over time, these parts can become defective or stop working. They become litter or junk inside an otherwise healthy cell. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of different auto autophagy mechanisms that your body can activate. Thinking that intermittent fasting or water fasting will activate all of them is silly in my opinion. This is where dry fasting excels. There are a new studies showing that new autophagy mechanisms are induced during dry fasting. These new mechanisms do not occur even during super long water fasts. They're unique to only dry fasting. Look up a study called Hypertonic Stress Promotes Autophagy and Microtubule Dependent Autophagosomal Clusters. Yes, it's a mouthful. This is why dry fasting is the most effective cure for many diseases and why people who do it swear by it. I bet there are hundreds more undiscovered mechanisms that occur during dry fasting. 
Not to mention that dry fasting is regarded as being around three times stronger than water fasting. So in that sense, three days of dry fasting are equal to seven or nine days of water-only fasting. Let's talk a little bit about why you need to start small if you're a beginner to fasting. Since this guide is for absolute beginners to fasting, it's important to explain why we don't dive into dry fasting right away. Dry fasting is an absolute stress on the body. We know that putting your body through stressors triggers the hormetic effect, which is necessary to strengthen and improve your body's capabilities. It turns out that when you cause some of these stressors, you also activate a lot of healing. If you do multiple cold exposures, your body gets cold adapted. But at the same time, you will unlock specific cold therapy healing mechanisms. If you do heat therapy like saunas, your body will become more efficient at cooling itself and at the same time, you unlock a healing mechanism based on heat shock proteins. These heat shock proteins provide another unique type of autophagy that you can't get anywhere else. So water and food deprivation is the ultimate stressor. So you can expect the ultimate rebound healing effect as well. But that's why it's so important that you start small. Because stressors are stressors for a reason. They put stress on your body and if you overdo it, you can get hurt. There is nothing worse than attempting to heal your body but ending up injuring yourself in the process. You'll hear this over and over. Dry fasting is not a sprint. Expect to take time to learn what it means to fast properly and learn to listen to your body. Learn how your body reacts during the glycogen depletion stage. Learn how powerful boredom can be when it comes to hunger. And feel what it feels like to fight the urge to pig out during your refeed. So I have created a guide that I call the Wolf Dry Fasting Beginners Protocol that specifically focuses on absolute beginners to dry fasting. It also assumes you're a beginner to fasting in general. However, if you've water fasted in the past, feel free to skip to the water fasting sections. Oh, sorry, the dry fasting sections. The water fasting section summarizes into a one-month water fasting crash course. The gist of it is as follows. You start with a 48-hour water fast, then take five days break to refeed. Then you do a three-day 72-hour water fast, and then take five days break to refeed again. And then you do a 120-hour water fast, which is five days, and then you take 10 days break to refeed. This will be the fastest and most efficient way to level up your fasting experience while at the same time giving your body time to adapt and become better at it. After this first month, you will be ready to move on to dry fasting. Because you have built up this fasting muscle, you can start with a two-day dry fast and your next month will look like this. You start with a 48-hour dry fast. Then you take a 5-day break to refeed. Then you do a 72-hour dry fast. And then take a 6-hour break to refeed. Then do a 120-hour dry fast and take at least 10 days break to refeed. After you've completed the two-month introduction to fasting, you will be able to call yourself an experienced faster, and new questions will pop up. Hopefully, you will continue the journey and keep learning. And now I also added a cheat sheet approach, and I know that some of you will cut corners, so here's an alternate version that doesn't move as slowly. So naturally, it's not going to be as safe, it is also not recommended for most people, and specifically, if you are very sick or old, you should take 
this whole experience as gradual as possible. So this is called the Wolf Dry Fasting Speed Run Protocol. Jumping straight into dry fasting, if you're decently fit and healthy, will look like this. A 36-hour dry fast, refeed, followed by a 72-hour dry fast, refeed, and then a 120-hour dry fast. So you start with a 36-hour dry fast to get your feet wet. This is simply one day and two nights. This will show you how your body will react to the beginnings of a dry fast. If you've got too much toxicity, too much caffeine withdrawal, or too much sugar withdrawal, it is highly recommended to eat a strict ketogenic diet for at least two days before you start this. After you complete the 36 hours, you refeed for three days or longer, and then do a 72-hour dry fast when you're feeling ready for it. This is the one that shows you that it is perfectly possible for you to go three days without water, breaking through a big society-induced mental block. After this, you refeed for five days and then do a 120 hour dry fast. So that's going to be a five day dry fast. This is the ultimate step for most people. If you are not suffering a chronic debilitating injury, you will most likely not need to dry fast longer than five days. Multiple five day dry fasts have been shown to heal most injuries and health issues. If you do have a severe illness, though, then you will need to continue this journey of learning and lengthening your dry fasts. This will involve experimentation, listening to your body, reading other people's experiences, potentially a coach to speed things up and get some peace of mind, and the most important one, time. Some common severe illnesses that, for example, a 9 to 11 day dry fasts are expected to heal, and I've personally helped some people with these, are long COVID, lupus, and Lyme's disease, and a few other autoimmune issues. So diet choices. This next part will explain how to fast, what to eat afterward, and when to do it with a step-by-step -step guide. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit about food choices. There is currently a big divide between different schools of thought when it comes to diets and what people are eating. On opposite sides, you have the vegan diet versus the carnivore diet. The carnivore diet has been gaining popularity quite quickly with its ability to provide drastic anti-inflammatory effects. Nonetheless, both vegans and carnivores dry fast to excellent results. Why is the carnivore diet winning in society, though? Probably because animal products are more satiating to the average consumer, so it's much easier to deal with this transition. Is it the correct answer for the healthiest diet, though? We don't know. I'm not a fan of picking a side and never straying from it, so I like to dabble in everything. I will say that I try, although I will say that I try to avoid gluten and artificial sugar as much as possible. Let me just go off on a bit of a tangent. Why do I avoid gluten? I know a lot of people will be like, oh, that's just a, a fad and you're jumping on the gluten-free train. But I know that uh, there's not really enough evidence to say that gluten is bad for you. Sure, if you have celiac disease, you need to avoid gluten. But it's important to know that humans have digestive enzymes that help us break down food, obviously. And there's this thing called protease. Protease is the enzyme that helps our body process proteins, but it can't completely break down gluten. What it does is it turns it into gliadin. Gliadin is a protein that looks very similar to a thyroid enzyme. And if the body attacks the gliadin from the gluten, you are setting yourself up for an autoimmune issue, 
where on top of everything, your body is also attacking the thyroid. If you have any issues that may be caused by hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, consider removing gluten from your diet. Not only is gliadin an issue, gliadin and similar gluten-degraded substances are called gluten exorphins. These compounds have proven opioid effects that could mask a lot of bad effects coming from gluten. Imagine eating something poisonous to the body. Naturally, you'd expect to feel nauseated and sick. Because it's processed into opioid-like substances, they create a feeling of euphoria and feel-good symptoms that are going to hide the bad effects. Think of a drug addict taking heroin because the euphoric feeling masks how damaging it is to their bodies. Suddenly, that addiction to carbs starts to make sense, especially when you understand the ad ad addictive or the addictivity of opioid substances. We've all heard that bread turns to sugar in the body and that sugar triggers similar receptors in the brain that cocaine does as well. But this gluten processing into morphine-like gluten exorphins starts to make a lot more sense. Not to mention that gluten intake is associated with the development of celiac disease and a lot of other related disorders like diabetes, depression, and schizophrenia. Also important to know is that a lot more people are being diagnosed with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, so you don't truly need to have a celiac disease to be negatively affected by gluten. So have I scared you off of eating gluten-based food? Good, let's continue. I mentioned that there's a big divide between the carnivore way of eating and the vegan way of eating. For this beginner's fasting guide, I am going to focus on an omnivore approach, my current favorite. It does skip actual meat for the refeed period though, since meat is very heavy on the digestive system. I'll discuss both the carnivore and vegan approaches at a later time, and most likely a later episode. So preparations for your dry fasts. Before I start with the refeed program for beginners, which I think a lot of people are here for, <clears throat> I need to briefly describe the preparation steps you should be doing before starting any extended dry fast. You want to make sure that you are as well prepared as possible before you start. The best things you can do is to start with a ketogenic-based diet at least one week prior to your fast. This will help your body transition into fat burning and it will begin the process of adaptation so that you are not stuck with a full-blown keto flu in the first days of your fast. You should also consider lowering your caffeine intake. If you are a coffee drinker, consider switching to green tea as you prep. Your next step is to transition from the keto diet to juicing for three days before you start your fast so that your bowels are very clean and do not have pieces of fermenting undigested food for when your digestive system goes to shut down. Juicing also brings in fantastic levels of electrolytes that hydrate you very deeply. Here are three juicing recipes I use throughout the days. I chose these specifically because they taste amazing and therefore they are great for beginners to juicing. But feel free to experiment a bit more with kale and other potassium-rich fruits and vegetables. The first juice is called Green Goddess, and it is three stalks of celery, half a large cucumber, one medium green apple, and one medium pear. The second juice is called Ginger Zinger, and it's two medium apples, five carrots, half an inch fresh ginger, and a quarter of a lemon. The juice three is called an immune booster and it's two oranges, a quarter of a lemon, one medium apple, and half an inch fresh ginger. Of course there are hundreds of other juices out there and you should feel free to experiment. And when juicing during the three-day preparation period, you can also drink milk kefir uh, as a very digestible food. 
Kefir is not like other dairy products since it is easily digestible and contains little sugar in the form of lactose, especially if you let it ferment for a longer period of time. The proteins in the milk also break down and are virtually in a pre-digested state. It's so smooth and so good for your body. Oh, also with that juice fast, I think I forgot to mention that if it gives you a certain amount, you should always dilute it at least with double the amount of water since you are trying to super hydrate and it lets the juice go a longer way. You can also consider doing a water enema the night before and the morning of the fast. This is the ultimate cleanse that will make your experience much easier. These enemas are able to get all the remaining toxins out of your colon. There is some evidence that the body will try and reabsorb anything it can get its hands on during an extended fast, including inside the colon. Another thing that should be taken into consideration is that some pathogens will feed on anything left in your colon. Normally, a quick juice fast will be able to knock out 90% of the matter trapped in there. So it's up to you about how clean you want to be going in. So a summary of the preparation that we just went through. Eat a ketogenic diet at least a few days before the fast. Consider juicing two to three days before the fast to clean out your colon while super hydrating your body. If you really want to do it in easy mode and ensure that you can go longer, consider using a water enema before starting. Lower your caffeine gradually to as little as possible before you start and lower your sugar consumption so that you can get through sugar withdrawal before you start. Now, onto the refeed protocol schedule. This refeed schedule is based on someone doing a 3-5 to five day dry fast. The refeed schedule can be adapted to longer and shorter fasts by extending or shortening the window. For myself, for example, I've done much longer fasts and I still use this type of refeed, but I extend it. If you are doing a shorter than three day dry fast, then consider condensing the refeed program by merging the days so you're making it even smaller. For example, you can put days one and two together and days three and four together. If you are going longer, you can extend it. So like I just said, day one, encompass two full days and then the day two of the refeed will be the third or fourth day see where i'm going with this also remember that as long as you can avoid processed food and artificial sugars as well as avoid overeating you will technically still be in a healthy refeed state even if you start consuming meat and dairy past day six of your refeed play around with this refeed schedule as a guide Always eat slowly, chew your food extremely carefully, and listen to your body. If one of the foods makes you feel sick, stop eating it. All right, let's go to the details of the refeed. So we actually have this as a table um, on the transcript. So make sure you go to dryfastingclub.com if you want to pull it off and print it. So let's say you're ready to start a five-day dry fast. You've already completed a five-day water fast and you've broken through a big fasting barrier. Your body now understands that it won't die without constant eating. You've also hopefully already completed a three-day dry fast as well and broken through that second big fasting barrier. Your body now understands that it won't die without constant water drinking. The next big barrier will be a five to seven day dry fast. This one will be the most important for healing because it will allow you to reach the acidotic crisis, which occurs technically around day three, and continue throughout this healing crisis for a few more days. The first healing crisis completes around day seven, sometimes faster, sometimes slower depending on many factors like body composition, fasting experience, toxicity levels, and more. 
If you dig deeper, there's a secondary healing crisis that completes around day 11. People who have healed from severe chronic illnesses like Lyme disease, lupus, and others swear that you need to reach day 11 to truly rid yourself of the problem. The claim is that the first seven days eliminate the body of the illness, but the next few days eliminate the hidden roots of the illness. The point is that if you're trying to maximize the healing of any chronic illness, you want to be able to reach past day three in the acidotic crisis first, where deeper healing mechanisms are activated. You've got to push through that and go further. Your journey does not require you to jump headfirst into super long fasts. This is important. Many shorter ones have been shown to be very beneficial while you build up your fasting tolerance and experience. I personally think that this journey is one that should never end. After witnessing the miracles dry fasting can do for your body, how can you abandon it after you've healed yourself? There is always maintenance, rejuvenation, and even spiritual healing that would be wasted if you completely stopped. Okay. So the fast is now on day 5. You're ready to break it. You've completed 120 hours of dry fasting without anything touching your lips. You've made sure to breathe through your nose as much as possible, and even going so far as to use surgical tape to keep your mouth closed when sleeping. Congratulations, you've ascended to a new level of understanding your body's limits. It's time to put a stop to your body's destruction state, where it's eating away at all the protein imperfections and pathogens, and instead, let's turn on the rebuilding state, where, which will trigger repair and reconstruction on a cellular level. This is where the refeed becomes crucial, and doing a successful refeed will provide night and day differences when it comes to healing. On extended fasts, it's always important to first break the fast with high quality water. You want to slowly sip a glass of water over the course of 30 minutes. You want to gently tell your body the period of dryness is over and that it can start to expect rehydration. You will be tempted to drink a lot, but control yourself during this time. When in doubt, always follow the rule of ingesting small amounts of water or food and waiting 10 to 15 minutes before taking more. Your body will tell you if you can continue or not. After you've had some water and at least an hour has passed, you can start looking at the wolf omnivore refeed chart. There's an image attached to the transcription on dryfastingclub.com. I think I already said that. So I'm going to go through the days. So I'm going through this chart that you can print out. And I'll add some notes. On day one of the refeed, and on all other days, you'll see that eating meals are broken up into five per day, with three-hour intervals. You'll want to eat at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m., 6 p.m., and 9 p.m. to keep things simple. Of course, you can slightly modify the timings to a got accommodate your lifestyle, work, etc. But the main idea of spacing out your meals is what is important. We start with bone broth. You'll want high quality organic bone broth if you can. Some people purchase it as a powdered bone broth because it's so much easier to prepare and store. And some people make bone broth at home. Um, it is also acceptable to get organic bone broth from the store that is already packaged and just needs to be heated up. So bone broth is high in protein and low in calories, an excellent way to gently wake your body up and signal that it can start rebuilding. Bone broth is also rich in minerals that help build and strengthen your, you guessed it, bones. This is important because your body taps into, into your skeletal reserves when it requires minerals to buffer the acidity that ketosis causes. Bone broth also contains many other healthy nutrients including vitamins, amino acids, and essential fatty acids. And 
bone broth is super easily absorbed by the body. That's going to be the key here. Also, you can add light lemon water from freshly squeezed lemons. This helps alkalize your body and clears up mucus and mucus-related pathogens that may still be clinging on inside of you. Remember to seriously dilute the lemon water so that you can barely taste the lemon. Add liberal amounts of potassium to your water and lemon water since your body will be craving it. The reason um, I mentioned to really dilute the lemons is because a lot of experienced dry fasters don't, uh, don't um, want you taking in citrus very early into your refeed while you'll hear others swear by eating an orange after they're breaking their fast. However, I like to err on the side of caution and we'll try and keep the citrus as low as possible in the first two days. Uh, with potassium, so I said you can add a lot of potassium into your water and into your lemon water. Uh, potassium is one of the most important electrolytes and one that is lost extremely quickly during dry fasting. I use a potassium salt called no salt, and you should be able to find something like that at your local grocery store. It can be called no salt, low salt, um, or salt free. It's this salt is in the form of potassium chloride instead of regular salt, which is sodium chloride. You want to avoid regular sodium salt because your body has upregulated a lot of mechanisms like aldosterone and other hormones that have done everything possible to hold on to the salt. By taking in more salt in your food right after a fast, your body will hold on to it like a drowning cat. This is why a lot of people complain about rapid weight gain right after eating or eating after a fast. Eating salted foods early on will cause you to retain a lot of water and you will balloon up. I also highly recommend adding a few drops of iodine into a glass of water daily. This helps uh, with the mucosal issues and helps regulate your thyroid after a fast. There's a lot of research into the benefits of iodine and a lot of people swear by it. A lot of people are iodine deficient. And what it helps is, it will help from managing estrogen levels to immune system healing. Okay, we're moving on to day two of the refeed. Here we basically do everything from day one, but you don't have to dilute the bone broth as much anymore. You don't have to dilute the lemon water as much anymore. Using full potency bone broth is perfectly fine. This day, you can add fruit compote into your daily routine. Fruit compote is basically boiled fruits in a huge, huge vat of water. You boil them for hours in a huge pot of water. The result is slightly flavored water. Tastes delicious right after your dry fast. You get minerals, nutrients, and some sugars from the fruit. And it's important to remember that this comes in a very digestible format. It's very gentle and does not spike your insulin levels much. Something you need to be aware of after a fast, you really don't want to spike those insulin levels. If the fruit compote is not sitting well with you, you can substitute it for watermelon. Remember to keep avoiding salt on this day too. Your body, during a dry fast, really holds on to sodium like nothing else. So we really need to focus on the other electrolytes so you don't bloat like a balloon. I like to add magnesium citrate on this day as well. Mix it with water and sip it. This helps get your digestive system moving and cleaning itself, as well as helps replenish your magnesium stores, which is the second most important electrolyte. Uh, during a dry fast following potassium. Did you know that over 50% of Americans are magnesium deficient? That's a topic for another time. Day three means we are adding coconut water and kefir to the list of foods to eat and drink. Kefir or kefir, however you want to pronounce it. 
So we're still doing one cup at each meal. So we're really limiting the amount of food we're eating. We're just making it slightly more dense. And kefir should only be taken once during this day because it is dairy based and we don't want to overload. However, kefir is arguably the best digestible dairy option you can have and it includes a wide variety of beneficial bacteria. So a lot of dry fasting experts do highly recommend that you get some probiotics in you during the first and first days of the dry fast. Kefir is a great natural substitute for that. Um, coconut water is added for its potassium and magnesium richness, as well as sugars that will help with waking up your metabolism. You can eat and drink anything from the previous days as well. Try to keep salt to a minimum still. If you need to use some salt, then try and use the pink Himalayan salt, which has other minerals included. It's not listed in the table, but you can also add some berries to this day, as they are low in sugars and high in water. Think watermelon, raspberries, and blackberries. I would recommend waiting another day for blueberries, since they are higher on the glycemic index. So now day four adds fresh juice. This is where you'll start to get your larger amounts of sugars, which will speed up your metabolism even more. Because you've already started getting your body gradually used to sugars uh, with the fruit compote and water kefir, you're ready for the full-blown juices. Ideally, avoid pulp as much as possible. A juicer would be ideal. Make sure you add lots of lemon and citrus into your juices to top off your depleted vitamin C reserves, as well as clean up the various organs with the citric acid. On this day, you can also start having a little bit more than just one cup every meal, but it will continue to be important to portion control even though you will have urges to eat more. Feel free to start adding a little bit of salt on this day. Stick to Himalayan salt. All right, day five adds steamed vegetables. This is a fun day because you get to feel like you're actually consuming solids since the other foods were very water-based. However, they are steamed and much more easily digestible than raw vegetables. You'll still get fiber, so it will start bulking up your stool. And I personally love to mix in cauliflower, broccoli, and sweet potato cut into pieces and steamed. Delicious. Day six, which I believe is the last day on the refeed protocol, uh, means that you can now have an egg with each meal. It's highly recommended to do poached eggs to avoid frying and unnecessary oil, but any style of egg can technically work. You'll want to try to make sure that your yolk is runny so that you are not destroying the various vitamins. Uh, if you need to do scrambled eggs and you can't eat other than anything other than dry eggs, go for it. Uh, with this egg day, you are signaling to your body that the proteins and fats are now free-flowing and that your digestive system will need to keep up. Feel free to start salting as much as you want on this day. If you've successfully reached and breached day 6, you have done an amazing job refeeding. And it is still highly recommended to keep meals small on the following days as much as possible. So many people fail the refeed. It is extremely tough. Personally, I think that the refeed is twice, if not three times harder than the actual dry fast. It's also extremely important in healing your body and maximizing the healing effect. So remember, let your body guide you. And remember that your body does need 30 minutes to realize what you've put in it and if you should eat more or not. So do your best to avoid processed foods and gluten over the next few days and your body will thank you with powerful healing. Well, we're near the end of the episode. As always, references are in the show notes. If I've convinced you to try a day or two of dry fasting, maybe I've saved you some money on groceries. 
If you would like to support this podcast and my work at exploring dry fasting topics, I have a link in the show notes where you can donate and buy me a coffee. Leaving a five-star like or comment goes a long way. If you'd like to give me any ideas on how to improve the show or any comments in particular, I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to send me an email at yannick at dryfastingclub.com. If you're looking for some coaching for your next dry fast, send me an email as well. That's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening and make sure you join our Discord group. Good luck on your dry fasting journey.